All right, well, this is the Micro 2 lecture for April 23rd. And I'm gonna make it fairly short, mostly because I've got a five o'clock Zoom uh, meeting with the uh, Epics team that's doing the install at the Do's Inn. So, and I spent all day trying to get this ready, driving me crazy, pulling my hair out. Uh, but I finally sort of have it kind of ready. All right, so what I'm gonna do uh, is I'm gonna talk a little bit about I2C and I have talked about this before, but I, I want to give you a little demo, and I want to show you a logic analyzer that takes a look at this and, and actually uh, decodes the uh, signal for us and actually lets us see what's going on, which is, which is kind, of, kind of cool, and um, I think you'll enjoy seeing that. All right, so uh, first off, let me, um, let's see, I want to make sure I pull this one. Okay, I think I don't need I think I don't need this one anymore. And I do need my jump drive. No, hey, get out of there. No. No. All right. So, let me just pull up I want to pull up a little uh, few slides on the I2C protocol. And then that will help us uh, get started here. All right. And Okay, so let me project this, <coughs> and I'll put my little face back up here in a second. All right, so maybe I'll now yeah, we'll do this. All right, okay, so we'll talk about I2C. So on the PIC chip, we have two of these master synchronous serial ports. And they, uh, they come off the peripheral bus, uh, and uh, so they, uh, they're part of the data bus and part of the, the, uh, the, the data, the memory, uh, the, well, the, the random access and peripheral address bus. All right, so uh, there are two of these ports, and we're just going to use one of them. Um, and we're going to use it, we're, we're going to configure it for I squared C, and then uh, send it out. Uh, we're going to use the port. Uh, if we look at the, if we look at the data sheet, um, let's see. Um, sorry, I have too many things open at the moment. All right, now, data sheet. Uh, why is Acrobat not responding? Okay, well, I'm just gonna close it. Here we go. Okay, if we look at the data sheet, and we go to, I guess I wound up closing it in the end. Okay, ah, driving myself crazy here. All right, let me get the data sheet back up. is coming up, believe it or not. Okay, maybe it's not. Yeah, there it is, okay. All right, a little bit. So if we go to, so the, the easiest way to uh, get to the table that you wanna see where all the, what, where all the pins are, are, are able to do the, the various things, click on table of contents, and then you scroll backwards one page. And 
and this is it. Let me um, let me expand this just a little bit, and uh, we'll blow it up just a little bit. Yeah, that should be good. So, and what you can see then, here are all 20 pins, and um, the so the master synchronous serial port is uh, right here. We have two of them, and so one of them is one of them. So the whenever you look at I squared C, and this is kind of important. Um, let me let me bring up this, and we'll we'll do the data visualizer over here. So let's bring this back up, and we will move this one. All right. So if I if I look at uh, the uh, oh shucks I had it working great now it's not working and there we go okay if you look at the data visualizer here what you see is uh, the I squared C is always labeled S C L and S D A. Now, what makes this confusing is in the SPI world, the clock is labeled S C K. So, you, and when you look at the data sheet, you realize that that they're mixing these notations. And then on the data sheet, the, under so this is I two C, this is SPI. Under SPI, the clock is S C K. The the then you have MOSI and MISO, which uh, MOSI is master out slave in, so that's serial data out for the master, and MISO is serial data in for the master, SDI. And then you have slave, slave select. So these are the four pins that you generally have available on SPI, and these are the two on SCL. So notice the clocks are confusing, and also we have SCL and SCK, we have SDA and SDO and SDI. MOSI and MISO are much much easier to comp much better to comprehend because it's master out, slave in, master in, slave out, which tells you exactly which way it's going. Whereas serial data in for the master is connected to serial data out to the slave. But MISO and MOSI would be the MISO on the master would be connected to the MISO on the slave and the MOSI on the master would be detected to the MOSI on the slave. But the problem is these apparently are proprietary and so people don't want to use them because they don't want to get sued. But it's really sad because they're, they're, they're really uh, a great idea. But anyway, we're not doing SPI right now. We're just doing I2C. I will show you SPI hopefully next week. I spent all day trying to get it going and I failed. Uh, anyway, um, so today we're dealing with SCL and SDA. All right, so with that in mind, yeah, we'll, we'll put this back here and make sure we can see this when we come back to it. Oh, I think it has to be on, this. It has to be on the back, on the white background. There we go. Okay. It it just blurs out if I don't put this paper block thing in there. I, I don't know, it's kind of interesting. Anyway, long story short, uh, it works like this and it doesn't work any other way. And I think what I'm going to do is uh, reset this because I think this went in, went off the rails. Until you, I think I'll turn it on and off. Okay. And uh, did something come loose? Maybe maybe it's because of my uh, oh I see well I'm gonna see what happens if I do this oh man oh gosh okay there it goes all right okay perfect all right we'll come back to that in a minute. All right, going back over here to uh, okay. Right. So.
So in the data sheet, you'll notice that on our board, we have pull-up resistors on pins on RB, um, on RB4 and RB6. So we are using, we're using SDA1, so we're using module number one, and we're using the SDA line on RB4, and we're using module one, number one, and we're using the SCL line on RB6. Okay, so, so that's how it's connected. And on our board, we, had, we put pull-up resistors on RB4 and RB6, so it's all set to go. All right, so let me, let me go through the slides just a little bit, and then I'll do a little more of the demo here in just a second. All right, so again, and we will do this. Okay, so here's the master synchronous zero port, and um, this is well, this is the this is uh, so this is the chip that's on the back of our um, little module. So again, if I I'll I'll, I'll flip over the module and let you see that uh, here. Um, so if I switch this out again, flip this up. And I flip the module over. You'll see there's a little there's a little daughter board on the back here, and uh, maybe you can see it better like this. And this is the little daughter board, and you can see it's kind of plugged in. And this chip right here, that's the PCF 8574. All right, perfect. Okay. Ah, I like that. And I'll just orient this just a little bit better. Okay, perfect. Okay, now um, switching back over. Okay, so so this is this is the chip. Now, the way this works, if you remember, uh, we talked about the uh, the the LCD display, the two line by sixteen LCD display. But it all you can also be two line by forty. It can be four line by twenty. It can be a bunch of different things. But normally, the most common one is the two line by sixteen. And we can drive it with this little, this cool little chip, this PCF8574. It also comes in a, uh, in a couple of different varieties, an 8574A and an 8574. And the difference is that the A uh, has a different I, I squared C address. And so even though you can set, you have three address lines, you can set the lower three bits of the address, of the slave address here. But that would still only allow you to use eight of these chips. If you wanted to use more, you'd have to use you'd have to have make some of them 8574s and some of them 8574As, and then you would get a, a different upper uh, four bits of address, and then you could still have eight more of these. Anyway, so that way you could have up to 16 of these. Um, and what this chip does is it takes an I squared C input. So here's your I squared C, your SDA line, and your SCL. Now the nice thing in I squared C both on the slave and on the master, the data line is SDA and the clock line is SCL, and we just always connect these. And the only tricky thing is these lines uh, are driven by open collectors, so they must have pull-ups. And that's, uh, that's the only requirement that's a little confusing. It does have, uh, it does have the capability to generate an interrupt, um, and then it has eight output pins, P0, 1, 2, 3, Four, five, six, and seven, and uh, so, so the way is what's really nice about this chip is you can you can write or read these lines. Now, the reading of the lines is a little tricky because they are they are they're essentially open collector lines as well. And so, what if you want to read this port, you have to set all the lines high, and then 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 if your device that's connected to it's driving the lines in the other direction, it will pull uh, any lines that it pulls low will show low, any lines that it would drive high stay high, and then you can read the inputs. But before you can do that, you must set all the outputs high. And, uh, and then when you want to write again, then you, then you change this around and you set all the outputs to whatever you want them to be. Uh, but it, the, the but that's, the nice thing about that is it, it does allow, in a, it's, a, it's not a it's not a really buffered, perfect bi-directional interface, but it does work bi-directionally. Uh, it's just a little fiddle. And then, of course, you have ground and power. Um, all right, and then these three pins, of course, set the lower three bits of address. On our device, they are, they are uh, pulled high with uh, 5 or 10K ohm resistors. And 
you have little little shorting pads that you can short over if you want to set them low. And so you can, if you want to, if you have more than one of these, then you can you can change these lines. Uh, and the little daughter board gives you a little space where you can do that with a sign and iron. Okay, um, so you can have seven uh, I squared C. Uh, the standard I squared C runs with seven bits of address. There is provision for a ten bit address. Uh, but I have not seen a device with a 10-bit address, but I guess they must be out there. Uh, so for all practical purposes, you're limited to about 128 devices, assuming that everything had a different address. But the problem is, uh, if you put that many devices on, on these lines, uh, they then because of the, the load on the lines, uh, they you can't run them very fast, and it, and it basically starts to fail. So there are practical limits due to the impedance and also practical limits due to addresses because the devices are, come hardwired with some of their address bits already programmed in. So, okay. Um, all right, so now we see, uh, yeah, so this is the addressing scheme. We're using the PCF8574 and uh, it has a hard, it has a built-in 7-bit address of 0, 1, 0, 0, and then these bottom three, which uh, I already said were all pulled high so basically our address is 01001111 for 27 in 7 bits. Now when you actually transmit the address, it's shifted left one bit and the lower bit, the, the final zero bit, is, uh, is set as either a 1 or a 0 depending on whether it's a write or a read. Okay, um, so the, supposedly if you send out uh, a slave address of 00, zero all slaves are supposed to respond to it. But many slaves haven't implemented this, and I don't even know what you're supposed to do with that. Um, you can have, uh, if a slave is not keeping up with the master clock, then the slave can hold the clock line low, and the master will detect this and uh, slow down and wait till the slave releases the clock line before it does the next tick of the clock. So a slave can actually, it's called clock stretching, the slave can actually uh, stretch the clock if it needs to. All right, you can have multiple masters uh, and they are set up so that they will de-conflict each other. And the way they do that is they start, they, they wait till the bus is, is uh, empty, uh, uh, idle they call it. And when the bus is idle, then they start transmitting. What if two masters start transmitting at exactly the same time? Well then as they send out ones and zeros, when you send out a one, you let the bus float high with the pull-up resistors. When you send out a zero, you pull the bus low. So if, the ma if one of the masters sends out a one and lets the bus float high, but the other master is sending out a zero, the bus won't float high, it'll show zero, and the master is supposed to detect that uh, and realize that it was trying to send a one, but a zero was asserted by apparently another master, so it will stop transmitting at that point. And even if the first two or three bits are all the same from both masters, eventually they'll, they'll be a bit that's different, and then that's when uh, the, one, the master that loses the, the arbitration is supposed to stop transmitting and let the other master continue. And so that's how it's supposed to work. But in reality, I don't think multiple masters are used very often. Uh, all right. And then uh, again, uses open collector requires pull-ups. The pull-up, the value of the pull-up has to be chosen somewhat prudently, because you want to pick a value that uh, that does not uh, that that allows the, the 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 bus to pull up fast enough uh, that it can keep up with the clock rate. Uh, and so so you so you usually set it so that uh, you know, you, you so typically something like two and a half ohms, um, I mean, sorry, 2.5 uh, kilo ohms, or maybe all the way up to four and a half, something like that, four and a half kilo ohms. Kilo ohms. Um, so two, somewhere between the 2.4 and 5 uh, K ohms is kind of what we do. Uh, and you can adjust that to make it work. Uh, okay. So the open collector driver looks like this. You basically have a, a transistor where the, uh, the IC output is driven into the base and out, out uh, the emitter, it's ground. So obviously it's an MPN. And 
when the transistor is turned on, it pulls the collector. Then the resistance through here is very is very low, and it pulls the uh, it pulls this bus to ground. When the transistor is turned off because there's no current flowing into the base, then the open collector uh, then this is a very high resistance in here, and the open collector then uh, basically floats. And since we have a pull-up resistor of, in this case, I think we used, I think we used 4K, uh, the uh, the the bus will be pulled up to VCC. All right. And all all devices connected to both the clock line and the data line have to be connected with this open collector uh, uh, format. All right. And well, one more thought. And that's also why you set both of the inputs, the TRIS bits are set to input on for your I2C module when you configure it, because the I2C module will, will take care of this, but it doesn't want it doesn't want the, the flip-flop associated with the pin to be connected to the output because the flip-flop is going to drive that pin hard in a, either to ground or hard to, to one to VCC. So you don't want that flip-flop connected. So you want them both set as inputs so your your uh, the flip-flop associated with those two pins is disconnected. All right, um, so there's a whole bunch of things that happen in I2C. We talk about the master mode and slave mode. So there's always uh, at least one master. There's and there's can and then there could be many slaves. Uh, we talk about uh, bytes acting and knacking. Uh, and that's in the slave mode. And what that is when the master transmits a byte. The slave acknowledges receiving it with an ACK. When the master receives a byte then the, uh, from the slave, then the master acknowledges it with an ACK. And typically, they set it up so that they 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 uh, knack if they want to read another byte. Uh, they ACK if they're done, or vice versa. I forget. Um, all right. We also have a start and a stop bit. So. Uh, so the start bit and the, st the stop and the start conditions are uh, are uh, slightly unusual uh, bus uh, exchanges, and uh, and so they they do mark kind of the beginning. We also have a thing called a restart, but it is again just a second start uh, before a stop's been issued. And then uh, I already mentioned clock stretching. Uh, we, we talked about bus collision when uh, two things are competing for the same bus, and then. The general call, uh, which it doesn't really, I think, isn't particularly useful. Uh, all right. So here's your master synchronous serial port block diagram, and um, so here here it is in I2C master mode. And basically, then first we have this this baud rate generator that generates the clock, and when we when we're ready to do this, we basically load a byte we want to send into the SSP, uh, since we're using one, SSP1 buff. And then when, it, when it's, uh, then it's transferred to the shift register, which we, we can't read or write the shift register. We don't get to see that. Uh, and then it's shifted out down, the data is shifted out the SDA line and the clock uh, ticks away to synchronize the reception of this at the other end. And we're going to look at the, uh, we're going to look at the the SDA and the SCL lines on the logic analyzer here in just a second, and you'll see how that works. Um, ah, okay, I'm almost out of time. Um, I am out of time, actually. So we have a start bit. Uh, we have then some conditions. We can detect a start bit and a stop bit, and then some collision problems and stuff. And, and Okay, so um, here's what it looks like. Two lines and the pull-up resistors. So it's a very efficient connection. When you add more slaves, you don't add any more lines. You just connect them to the same line. And I'm not going to go through all this stuff. Uh, these are just different terms. I did want to point out the start condition. So normally, you're not allowed to change the data line when the clock is high. You're only allowed to change the data line when you've pulled the clock low. So change the data loud, clock is low. Change clock is high, change the data not. But under the start condition, we pull the data line low while the clock is high. That's the start condition. And under the stop condition, while the while the clock is high, we release the data line and let it go high. 
through the pull-up resistor. That's the stop condition. This is the start condition. And, and those are the only times that the data line should change when the clock is high. All the rest of the data, we change the data when the clock is low. When we let the clock go back high, the data is red. Then we set the next bit, the clock goes up, we read that, clock goes down, we change the next bit, clock goes up, and so forth. And the restart condition is, is, is exactly the same as the start condition. The only difference is uh, it's that, well, there's no difference really, but, but uh, the start, we call it a start when it's, when, it's, um, when, when it's beginning after there's been a previous stop condition or it's the initial transmission. Okay, that's all I wanted to say on that. Let's um, close that down. And then I want to show you the, uh, the data analyzer here real quick. Let's see, where is it? Here it is. Okay, so, so here's the way this works. Now, I'll, I'll show you how, you how it captures data right now. Uh, I'm going to reset it, and hopefully it'll, in hopes that it'll reset. Okay, yeah, it's, it's good. Okay, and then I'll also show you the data visualizer, so it's down here. So it's capturing this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to time it. I'll send it out, sampling. Okay, so it, it captured the transmission of the C. And now if you look, wow, there's nothing there on my analyzer. Well, so what you have to do, you have to, you have to use the scroll wheel, and you have to scroll down and hopefully find, uh, find where it is. And I don't know. Maybe we didn't capture it, so we'll try it again. Okay, I'm going to stop it. I'm going to do it again. Okay, we did definitely caught one then. And so then, let's see if I can make this work. Oh, man. I'm, uh, let's see. Why is it not showing up in the data? All right, let me try one more. Oh, oh, I know why. We disconnected it. Uh, okay, well, uh, that's a good reason why it's not working. All right, so the black goes to the black. And okay, now we go. Okay, um, all right, <laughs> crap, I'm gonna, I'm gonna set it one more time. Okay. Okay. So here is the data. It looks. I think I caught the B. Now notice there's when you just look at it like this, you just see this little line. But as I scroll, I can expand it because I had to capture quite a bit of data here. And what's really interesting is, so the first thing is the uh, to recognize is that the uh, the top line is the clock. Okay, and so the green indicates a start bit, a, the red is a stop bit, and then all these greens are essentially they're start bits, but they're just but they're restart bits because we didn't have a stop in between. And basically, then uh, the first one is uh, we have a right bit. I think we should be able to see the. Uh, not sure why we can't see the. Uh, uh, the the code. So let me see. Maybe we can. That's the SDA. Uh, okay. No, I don't want that. Okay, I don't want that. Um, I think maybe the protocol. Okay, analyzer. Oh yeah, here's what I want. So, uh, so I think ASCII. Uh, let's see. Let's do ASCII and hex. Let's do hex. Yeah. Okay. So, so now you can see. So notice, notice here, the first frame is it's it's it has a right bit appended to it, and the seven bit address is twenty seven. Okay. So that's, that's the slave address, 27. And then here, that's our first data. We wrote 4D, and then we wrote 49. And then we wrote 2D and 29. And um, I, so 
what, what these what this 40 and 49 was we put in uh, the upper four bits of the character uh, C and then we uh, the second one we toggled the E line and we also this all the 40 also includes setting the register select line low uh, and the read write line uh, low and then in the 49 the only thing that changed is we we toggled the E line and then we did the same thing here uh, 2D and 29 so basically the data uh, I the data was 42 I guess that was a B so if you look at the ASCII character the data was actually 42 upper four bits lower four bits and then um, then we I'm not sure what all this is actually. I'll have to go back and remember how we sent everything out. But if you go through your program, you'll see that, that we sent all this stuff out just like this. And then somehow we had two stop bits. I don't know why there are two. But anyway, um, maybe. It, um, so this is a really, when you're, when you're having problems and it's not working correctly, this is a great way to, uh, to decode it. And all I do, I have one, one wire, I have common ground, and my analyzer then has one wire connected to SCL and one wire connected to channel one is connected to SDA and then I get my choice over here of protocols and I pulled up the I2C protocol and it automatically decodes all this for me so and that's what you have to do uh, the USB protocol is much more complicated the SPI protocol is a little simpler and this also shows you the clock uh, so the clock goes goes from high to low it stays low after the start bit and then it starts ticking away and shifting out the clock is totally synchronized with the data and when there's no data the clock isn't changing it's it's allowed to idle and that would be so another master could pick up the bus and do something with it if they want it all right I have to quit uh, we'll stop with that and uh, we'll try and do a little more next time